Welcome to Shielded, a special forum looking at law enforcement and police accountability. My name is Connor Goodwin, and I'm ProPublica's Interim Director of Communications. Tonight, we'll be drawing on two recent ProPublica investigations, one focused on New York City's police department and the other on the sheriff's office in Jefferson Parish, a suburb outside New Orleans. We'll be hearing from the reporters involved in these investigations, and our hope is to foster a robust conversation about policing and accountability. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. And tonight's event is brought to you in partnership with WWNO and WRKF, the Louisiana Public Radio Stations, which took part in our local reporting network this past year. Following the killing of George Floyd, the national discussion of police reform and accountability took on a new urgency, but more than a year later, little has changed. As ProPublica's reporting on New York City's police department and WWNO and WRKF's recent investigation into the Sheriff's Office in Louisiana's Jefferson Parish have revealed, many, many law enforcement agencies operate with little effective oversight, making it hard to hold police accountable. By cross-examining these investigations, editors and reporters from both news organizations will distill larger lessons on how accountability really works for law enforcement. Tonight's conversation will be split into four parts. In the first three sections, our panelists will discuss accountability, transparency, and then reform. The final section will be dedicated to answering questions from the audience. To ask a question at any point, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and type it there. Now, allow me to introduce the reporters. Richard A. Webster is an investigative reporter based in New Orleans who reported the Jefferson Parish series for WWNO and WRKF. Webster previously covered the criminal justice system for a variety of publications, including ProPublica, The Washington Post, and The Guardian. Topher Sanders covers race, inequality, and the justice system for ProPublica. In 2019, he was part of a team that was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for public service and won the Peabody and George Polk Awards for their coverage of President Trump's family separation policy. Eric Umansky is a deputy managing editor of ProPublica, where he has overseen two Pulitzer Prize winning projects, including a series he edited on NYPD abuse of nuisance abatement laws. Our moderator today is Nicole Carr. Nicole is an investigative reporter covering criminal justice and racial inequity for ProPublica's South Unit. Thanks again for joining us and thanks to McKinsey and Company for their support. I'll let Nicole take it from here. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> You'd think we'd know how to do this by now, right? <laughs> Thanks, Connor, and thank you to everyone joining us here tonight and our awesome panelists. Um, we're going to start in this section of accountability, but uh, before we get to the questions, and we'll start out with Rich. Rich, will you give us a brief overview of your latest project in Jefferson Parish? Sure, we looked at, uh, spent the last year looking at the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office. Jefferson Parish is a suburb of New Orleans, um, whereas New Orleans is majority uh, black community. Jefferson Parish is majority white, very conservative. And we had heard from the residents there in the black community that there were a lot of abuses happening. And they looked right across the border in New Orleans where there was a consent decree and the Department of Justice came in and they said, why? are people not looking as closely at the sheriff's office when equally, if not worse, things are happening? Um, so when we're talking about operations and accountability, we're really talking about two different structures in terms of the way uh, the leadership uh, is put in place, right? So when we're talking about big cities and uh, police departments, the chief uh, is usually appointed or chosen by the mayor. And so you have that oversight with the city leadership when it comes to the police department, with the sheriff's offices, we're talking about elected officials. We're talking about uh, partisanship and we're, we're talking about the voters having a say in, in who becomes the sheriff. How does this impact the way that the sheriff's office operates? Sure. I mean, it, it impacts pretty much every facet of it. So the sheriffs in Louisiana, it's a constitutionally created and protected position. Um, you know, as you said, the parish president council has no sway, no power over the sheriff's office. They were only held accountable by the electorate. So once every four years, they go before the voters. 
And, you know, in Jefferson Parish specifically, an incumbent sheriff has not lost an election since 1979. So there is not a whole lot of change. They're very powerful. Once you're in office, you're basically there for as long as you want. Um, you know, and, and that plays out in a lot of different ways. So the most powerful sheriff in Jefferson Parish in history is Sheriff Harry Lee. He was there for 28 years, you know, despite the fact that he, in what people described, um, espoused openly racist policies. You know, he said that if a black driver was caught in a white neighborhood, that they would be stopped. And yet he was elected over and over and over again. Um, you know, in Jefferson Parish, they only this past October announced that they were going to implement body cameras and they were the last large law enforcement department in not only the state but the country to hold out on implementing body cameras and that's just because there's just not a whole lot of public pressure and you know you contrast that real quickly with new orleans where it was one of the worst police departments in the entire country and you know a coalition of residents both black and white civil rights organizations and attorneys and public and elected officials came together and they just said this this will not stand and they demanded change and that's what happened. So there was never a time where you saw a lot of demographics changing in Jefferson Parish to put on that type of public pressure. I mean, there's definitely changes, like small changes, you know, the black population is growing, the Hispanic population is growing, but not enough to sort of exert any sort of like big change so far. And Eric, we're gonna we're gonna get to you now in this this section and just an overview of your latest reporting. And one of your latest pieces was just out about a week ago, following up on NYPD. But kind of give us an overview of, of where you were with that report. Sure. So so you know I I should say I I uh, don't have uh, a history of doing uh, police reporting. Um, I actually ended up doing this um, through a, uh, frankly, a very personal way, which is that um, uh, my wife and our then six-year-old daughter, uh, two Halloweens ago, were walking home from a friend's house and saw an NYPD uh, police car go up the wrong way on the street um, and hit a teenager. Um, and it was very disturbing. Um, and my wife came home and uh, uh, told me about it. And um, I, I went to check it out and I followed up with the police. And, and what they actually ended up telling me was, um, oh no, your wife didn't see what she thought she saw. Um, a, uh, a police car did not hit uh, that teenager. Actually, the teenager ran across the hood of a parked, uh, of a stopped uh, police car. So it was like, basically uh, the police car didn't hit the kid, the kid hit the police car. Um, and I ended up saying like, I ended up following up on that and actually canvassed our neighborhood and spoke to other witnesses who said they saw exactly what uh, my wife had saw. And the NYPD, when I followed up with them, stuck to it. And I said, so let me just be clear. You guys are going to tell me that four people didn't see what they say they saw. That's what you're going to stick to. And the answer was, yes, that's exactly what they were going to stick to. And, and that moment really stuck with me and frankly stuck in my craw as a way of saying, well, wait a second, you guys can just brazenly, frankly, you know, say something that multiple witnesses uh, uh, say is not true. And who's going to hold you accountable? Who's going to check this, right? Who, who's going to follow up on this? And, and that led me to say, well, how does accountability work? for the nation's largest police department. Um, and, it, and it led me to, to um, dig into that. And, and the answer um, that I came back with, which is you know, no surprise, but the, but the specifics are revelatory, is it doesn't really work. The system is set up uh, bluntly and frankly not to work. Um, there is very little independent uh, effective Oversight, and and that's something that uh, not just myself, but our but ProPublica really ended up diving uh, into, uh, including by the way, our fellow uh, panelist here, Topher, um, also did great work about how uh, police officers were being promoted uh, to some of the highest levels of the NYPD despite long problematic uh, records. Uh, just to take one example, and, and um, uh, you know, he, he did multiple stories. 
And Topher, I do want you to jump in on this. We're gonna get uh, more into the description of, of your reporting, but as you were seeing these promotions and uh, you obviously run across the red flags or potential red flags that the public would not have known about. In all. Yeah, it was really uh, thanks to some of the work that Eric was able to do to uh, free up some, some key data um, that um, at the time was um, available to more people than they thought, but, but Eric had the wits about him to go and, and make the request for the data. And so we were able to get a glimpse of kind of behind the, the machinery on what happens when officers are found to have, you know, violated, you know, basically their, their rule book, if you will, their, their policy manual. And um, it, was, it was what you might expect. Uh, a whole lot of nothing can happen uh, when officers uh, violate their rules. And so we were able to, to do a deep dive into several uh, kind of high ranking officers to get a sense of, you know, these officers uh, have been able to uh, withstand um, all the things that come with being an NYPD officer. They've risen through the ranks. And oh, by the way, they have this record of repeated uh, complaints against them from the public. And a number of those complaints being uh, substantiated, meaning that the body that looked at the complaint found there to be validity to the complaint. Um, and that went from everything from, you know, physical abuse to, you know, having uh, guns drawn on folks uh, to uh, people being um, hit with nightsticks, the, the, the whole shebang. And so there were several high-ranking uh, individuals among that list. We dove deep into a few of them and, and we found that uh, repeatedly, no matter what the complaints were and what the substantiation was, uh, the system found a way to promote them. And repeatedly over a, a, a long time span, right? Because we're, we're looking at careers here and these, this wasn't, you know, uh, the, the recent complaints or issues or investigations that were coming up. It was a pattern over time. Yeah, these uh, complaints span their career. Um, in fact, uh, sometimes you would see the complaints uh, become more serious and egregious once uh, these officers got a little bit of rank in them and they had a little bit of power and I guess maybe felt a little bit of immunity. Um, you'd see uh, some of the egregiousness of the complaints become even uh, more so uh, as they rose through the ranks. We're going to get into the impact of the reporting um, in, in a few minutes, a little further along into the program. But while we're talking about complaints, I want to kick this back to you, Rich, and um, kind of talk about the process for citizen complaints. You know, we just heard Eric talking about uh, witnesses and, and, and them being told they did not see what they, they really saw. How did the process work in Jefferson Parish for um, filing complaints in the follow-up to citizen complaints? And was that even happening? Yeah, this was one of the more shocking things that we found out. So one of the stories we looked at was Sojourner Gibbs. And this was a woman who was in a Sam's lot, uh, Sam's Club parking lot on Juneteenth getting groceries for her family celebration. And she had a diabetic seizure, went into shock. They called 911, deputies showed up. Uh, instead of you know providing aid, they accused her of being a drug addict, dragged her out of her car, threw her down on the ground, zip tied her hands. It was this whole traumatic uh, event. She's still traumatized to this day. Um, you know, And then so she filed a complaint through the system that you're supposed to. She had a witness, the witness had video. A month later, she gets a letter in the mail, two months later, saying they're all exonerated. She was never interviewed. The witness was never interviewed. They never looked at the video. Um, so, you know, it, it, it raised a lot of questions. So we asked for, you know, a public records request, give us all of the citizen complaints, and they refused. They said that's, that's confidential information. So we did wind up finding out that over a three-year period, the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office sustained a single citizen complaint over three years. And that was a deputy who went into the back of an ambulance, someone had tried to kill themselves and he smacked the person in the face and choked them. He got a three day suspension, I think. And during that same time period where the Sheriff's Office sustained a single citizen complaint, the New Orleans Police Department sustained 247. And that's a department that has more than 400, 400 more officers than the Sheriff's Office. So it's, there. It, it, betrayed the fact that there's little accountability or discipline happening in that department. 
And it would take a sustained complaint for this to become a public record, correct? For, for you to be able to pull that. I mean, that's what they said. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center sued because that was against the state's public records law that was thrown out. But yeah, that's what they said, that we could only get that. So we're going to segue into transparency. And Topher, I just want you to speak to police unions and the role that they play in um, getting to accountability. Um, how can they get involved at some times, obstruct that process? What, what were you finding in your reporting? Uh, obstruction is the only way they get involved based based on my experience and my reporting uh you know police unions are there to protect the members and um they take that uh definition of protection to mean to at all costs no matter how egregious uh the actions are to to shield and withhold and to frustrate the efforts of the public to understand know and uh, learn more about what's happened with a specific officer or with trends within uh, an agency. They're not fans of allowing data like the, the type that Eric was able to uh, procure and, and allow us to dig into. They're not fans of that data being released to the public. In fact, they sued uh, to keep that data uh, shielded and away from the public. Um, uh, the unions all over the country behave this way. This is not just NYPD, I'll give you a short story about what happened in just in Jacksonville, Florida, a place I reported right before I got to ProPublica. There used to be a process where when there was a police involved shooting, the final um, uh, kind of deliberative process was a public session, a public meeting where that officer would come in. There was a board that looked at whether that shooting was appropriate and followed all the regs. And anybody in the public could come and sit in that meeting and watch the proceedings of that meeting. A sheriff, Somewhere along the way said, you know what, we're going to close this off. We're not going to do this anymore. They shut down the public access to those meetings. Then a new sheriff said, I'm going to reopen them. Part of this reform energy, you know, I'm going to open them up so everybody can see them again. And the union threatened, the union got lawyers involved, the union. This was three years ago, an open process. Nobody was really saying boo about it except the union every one time there was a really bad shooting, they were saying boo about it. But the minute it shut down, the union used all of its might to keep it closed and away from the public. That's, that's the, what unions do. That's the experience I have with what police unions do across this country, whether we're talking South, West Coast, Midwest, or East Coast. Obviously play a huge part in funding campaigns and, and uh, impacting those decision makers and who ends up. And look at the topic. strings they pull, right? A sheriff who's an elected body, just like in Jacksonville, the sheriff is an elected officer. We know the conversations that are happening on the back table. Oh, I'll act like I want to open them up. You threaten to sue and I won't do anything and everybody will be all the happier. That's how this game is played. So despite all of that and, and not wanting that, that data set and what had really supported ProPublica's reporting, Eric, can you speak to the impact that the actual reporting had on transparency in the NYPD? What changed because of the, the access to this in this report? Uh, well, so we have been able to bring, bring uh, some transparency. As Topher has mentioned, um, you know, there was a, the union sued um, to keep police records, disciplinary records, uh, secret, uh, as they had been in decades, uh, for decades in uh, New York. And um, uh, we found ourselves in a very lucky and funny position where we got the, these files um, in the basically week or two, it took the uh, police union's lawyers to get themselves, to get their acts together to sue. So we got the information very quickly and we decided um, before they could move ahead with their case uh, in which a judge was actually putting a restraining order to say like none of this information can be made public. Um, we decided in a very responsible, deliberate way to say F it. This uh, information is in the public interest fundamentally. And um, so we put it out there. Um, and uh, uh, then, you know, the, the judge 
um, frankly, that created a kind of momentum uh, to make the information uh, public. And you know, we've done that with, uh, uh, generally speaking, with a number of cases. You know, you mentioned I published a story the other week. Um, it's because, or last week, uh, it's because a, a state judge ruled that the NYPD had illegally withheld uh, footage of a shooting, of a police shooting, but the police shot some, uh, uh, a man named Kowalski uh, Trawick. Um, and uh, a case that I ri uh, have written about, and, uh, you know, the, the, um, our uh, coverage was raised during uh, the case as an example of how uh, important uh, the evidence can be, how important the issues are, and bringing stuff to light. So it, it's not just, you know, data, it's, it's um, that, you know, paying attention uh, and really digging into uh, these cases, even when the police unions are fighting, even when a lot of the institutions, frankly, uh, uh, that are supposed to be um, pushing for accountability are not working as they should. Um, we're paying attention and, and that can make a difference. Well, while we're talking about data, I wanna go back to Rich and uh, some of your latest reporting on traffic stops. Um, talk about how you decided to go in this direction and what this reporting yielded. Yeah, so we had heard from a lot of people in Jefferson Parish that, you know, the, in the Black community that they were being racially profiled during traffic stops. You know, you can't go to the law enforcement agency and get this data. In 2001, there was this law passed by the state in, you know, a supposed effort to combat racial profiling where they required every police department, every sheriff's office, to collect data during traffic stops, you know, so far as the person's age, gender, race, ethnicity, et cetera, um, and then report it back to the state so they could look at the data and figure out whether this is happening. But the law included an out saying that if the law enforcement agency had a policy against racial profiling, then they're exempt. They don't have to do anything. You know, they basically solve racial profiling. So you, as you can imagine, every single law enforcement agency across the state scrambled to put together these policies. And no, you know, since 2001, I think two law enforcement agencies have ever submitted data. So anyway, so we decided to get six years worth of data from the court itself. Um, you know, that was 73,000 citations issued in Jefferson Parish. And you know, the first thing we found out was that black people were being cited one and a half times their population rate, but the thing that really stood out was out of 73,000 citations, only six people deputies claimed were Hispanic. And this is a pop, you know, the parish has 440,000 people, 18% are Hispanic. So that raised a whole lot of issues. Um, you know, and then the top 10 most common names of white drivers cited, five of the names were Hernandez, Rodriguez, Martinez, Gomez, Lopez. So it was pretty obvious that a lot of the people, basically every person who was Hispanic was being misidentified as white. And, you know, we talked to a lot of experts and they said, you know, one, it could be a systems issue, but, you know, it's also if everybody's white, there can't be any racial bias. So, you know, I mean, we reached out to the sheriff's office and they did not respond as they have not responded to any of our stories, but, you know, it raised a lot of concerning issues. And that gets into this question of, of how data is collected, how it is analyzed, how it's analyzed, because the way it's analyzed shapes priorities for the city, priorities shape policies. And if we don't have a problem here, we don't need to address it. So that you can talk about like the importance of the way that we interpret data that we have. The numbers were there, but they're being looked at this way. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the, the point of the law, if you need, you know, every expert that we talk to, you need to look at this data. The data shows everything. The data hopefully is going to be unbiased and you can figure out what is happening in any department that is interested in finding out whether misconduct is happening. They look at the data and, you know, there's a lot of states across the country. I think there's like 23 that have these data collecting laws in place, some are better than others. 
you know, North Carolina is good, California, Illinois, a bunch. But yeah, I mean, in, in a department that is very interested in figuring out and maintaining public trust, they look at the data. And it's pretty obvious that the Jefferson Bear Sheriff's Office is not looking at the data because if they were, you would hope that they would question why there were only six Hispanic people over six years pulled over and cited. So if we get into this conversation on reform and, and what you all have seen as a result of your reporting so far, let's just do a, a round robin as it relates to reform. Um, so for Eric, what have you all seen with NYPD and then Rich can uh, jump in. On I'll let Eric take that. Apart from the fruit baskets that they're uh, sending us, um, thanking us for our insightful coverage. Um, uh, well, I, I mean, on a on a broad level, I think that the 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 um, sort of final story has still to be written uh, on that. Um, as most folks know, there's a new mayor uh, who's coming into office. Uh, <laughs> I just saw Topher's uh, eyes light up. I, I, I can't say that uh, you know the the path to deep uh, uh, changes will necessarily uh, uh, come from him. We'll see. He's a former, for those who don't know, a former police officer himself, um, who actually has long called for uh, uh, reforms. But um, you know, the city council in New York, uh, uh, there have been actually a number of bills, a whole package of bills uh, proposed to reform how uh, oversight has done. Um, you know, one of the city councilors credited our coverage um, as uh, uh, sort of directly spurring uh, uh, some of those um, proposals. Um, you know, the, uh, I think that uh, final legislation has, uh, you know, still to be uh, voted on. But the, but the larger picture here is, as I think Topher was saying, this is, you know, decades and decades, if frankly not more, of a kind of institutional uh, resistance um, uh, to independent uh, oversight. I mean, just to give a, a sense of it, New York has a um, civilian oversight board. This is a real like um, mind twist, let's say. New York has a civilian oversight board of the NYPD. For the first decades of its existence, it existed a quote unquote civilian oversight board, it existed within the NYPD and only actually headed by NYPD officers and commanders, right? There was nothing civilian about it. It was about civilian complaints. And, and so you're talking about a sort of decades long uh, uh, path here where people have sort of chipped away and, and our job is to you know, show the reality um, and, and uh, policymakers and, and citizens um, can make decisions based on that. But, but I think this is a, um, you know, it is a very, very uh, long arc we are talking about. Uh, Topher, any, anything else? Not really, yeah, no, just that, um, I, you know, again, just like to tell stories. So, you know, here is an organization in, as, as the NYPD, where I don't know, maybe five, six years ago, they set up a, another uh, organization right. to dig into it called the Inspector General's Office, giving it all the powers of investigative authority. And it was set up to be, you know, here's the entity that will have the subpoena power and the ability to dig through the files and, and look at all the inside, you know, machinery that the, you know, the Civilian Review Board can't do and that, you know, other people can't do. Oh no, yeah, NYPD just told them to go fly kite too. For many, many years, telling them to fly a kite. Like, nah, you can't look at this. Nah, you can't get those documents. Nah, we don't think you should get that data. <laughs> and that's that's how they dealt with a body that was supposed to be their equal. It was supposed to be able to have access to all of that information. I, I just did, let me just chime in here for a second. I, I just did a quick story a couple of weeks ago on a report that uh, this inspector general uh, put out and we're gonna get into the issue uh, but about body worn cameras uh, and video evidence. I, I know I'm getting ahead of you and that, uh, but I'm only gonna drop this one little thing, which was a footnote in the report. The footnote in the report said, um, basically, BTW, by the way, we tried to meet with the NYPD to ask them about this issue. The NYPD refused to meet with us. 
right? Just like this is supposed to be an overseer of the NYPD and the agency that they are overseeing go told the, you know, told them to the politest term would be go fly a kite, as Toker just said. And Rich, we're going to get into uh, some questions concerning the DOJ and what it takes for them to get involved. But uh, first, I want to pull from the questions and I'm getting them in the chat. This kind of this relates to sheriff's offices. We had a question about, you know, accountability as it relates to that office, if, if you have taxpayers involved, taxpayers funding this, isn't there some sort of, you know, automatic oversight that comes along with being funded by the public? That would be I mean, the sheriff just collects a percentage of the tax. Um, again, it's, it's, they are, except for the electorate, they are just untouchable. There is no civilian oversight. There's literally nothing. Like, they don't have to do anything that they don't want to unless the voters vote them out or they they feel that they're threatened. And yeah, I mean, it's that's why reforms are just so hard to come by. So you would think that the tax issue would be something that you could wield, but no, I mean, there's a certain percentage that is allotted to them and then that's it, you know? Yeah, and if I could just piggyback all that, they respond only to political pressure. That is the thing that moves a sheriff in any way. And just keeping it 100, everybody can, can, can because they I think this may how run what works in New Orleans, I mean, in Louisiana, but in Florida, they're county, uh, you know, offices, right? They, they are responsible for a county. Uh, and because of that, like, they have their, their, their constituency blocks, you know, they should have a core city that will be diverse and have diverse interests and have diverse you know, needs and desires as it relates to their police agency. But then they have a lot of rural interests, and they're, they're, those b- political blocks have vastly different uh, desires and you know and requests of the sheriff, and they know where their bread is buttered, and so they end up uh, creating policies or reacting to you know political pressure that kind of fit, fits their voting block, if you will. Yeah, we have like- a similar setup in Georgia um, as well. I mean, we had an instance where uh, a sheriff was implicated in an indecent exposure um, incident. He was charged. He was um, found the video of him doing what he said he was not doing in the park. And he'd used a taxpayer funded vehicle to go in the middle of the night to do what he would. Officer involved exposure. Yes. Yeah. And was chased by a rookie cop with an APD who was not assigned body worn camera. So it was your word against my word and I'm gonna call up so-and-so and let's handle this. But what we found was the, the board of commissioners, you know, they would weigh in on, on the budget that the sheriff's office got. But once it got, once the money was there, nobody was overseeing budget, how you used your resources, any of that. And then when it came to, uh, you know, the decision in this, he was, he was charged, the judge found him guilty, did all of this stuff. When it came to stripping powers, the oversight board had so many levels of appeal that this man ended up fulfilling his, the rest of his term before anything could be done. And it was that constitutional law office power that allows you to appeal the state judge, to appeal the governor's office, to do all these things. This stuff can take years, you know, for, for anyone to be held accountable, even when certification is stripped from your top law enforcement officers. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of, of power in that. But um, Rich, when you're, when you're talking about DOJ involvement, like in New Orleans and talking about the consent decree and how they came in, what's the process for the feds to even choose what they're going to investigate and move forward with? Sure. And I just wanted to add one thing with the sheriffs. Like in Louisiana, the sheriffs don't respond to political pressure. Like they apply political pressure. Like that's like, uh, you know, yeah. like the sheriff's association is one of the most powerful lobbying organizations in the state. And the sheriffs also have a civilian like at will workforce that they can deploy as an army during elections. Like there's, I, they feel very little political pressure, I think. Um, 
But so, so far as like the Department of Justice, uh, you know, in doing this story, we talked to, you know, five or six former members of the DOJ, including Jonathan Smith, who was the head of the, um, the Civil Rights Division. So when they're choosing what department to look at, they said there's no sort of like set criteria. You don't have to have like this many uses of force. You don't have to have this many like deaths. Sometimes they choose it based on whether there is like an issue that they feel is not getting enough attention, but is like rife you know, throughout departments across the country, you know, like, you know, treatment of people, mistreatment of people with like mental health problems, like, you know, autistic people or mistreatment of the homeless. And so they'll choose a department that is, you know, having that issue just to sort of raise it to a national level. Um, you know, other than that, they said that, you know, one thing they said when Jonathan Smith was there, they had 15 attorneys working in the civil rights division. And he was pointed out that there are 18,000 law enforcement agencies across the country. And they're just flooded, especially now that Trump's out and Biden's in, and they're just now being flooded with all of these requests. So, you know, he made the point that there's only so much they can do, um, you know, but he raised the thing that in order to get this, sometimes it's high profile incidents like, you know, Michael Brown or Breonna Taylor or George Floyd, but he did emphasize, they all really did emphasize the fact that, you know, if people feel like their local law enforcement agency needs to be investigated, like, write the DOJ, get, a, you know, a mass of people together and make that request. It may not work, but they say that, you know, do that. But again, like it's sort of, I don't know, it's picking straws out of a pile. It's really hard to choose like how they do this. So in the instances where we've seen uh, true reform, video evidence has clearly been critical in, in um, getting to that step. So what happens when you don't have that? And we know there are all kinds of policies around um, use of body cam and, and, and not using it and, and who's required to do it and when. What do you rely on uh, in terms of a tool for reform when you don't have that type of evidence? Who's that for? I'm gonna kick it to you, Eric. <laughs> I mean, here's the God's honest truth. If if you don't have a video, if you don't have the receipts, uh, uh, it's really, really hard, right? It's really, really hard. I mean, if you think of the, the most infamous uh, cases of um, police violence, police killings, just to take uh, one category, you know, you, you just ran through... Um, a bunch of names, you know, here in New York, Eric Garner, uh, um, you know, obviously the list goes on. The vast majority of those we know about because somebody recorded it, right? And 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 if you if you look at the initial coverage, I mean, uh, you know, someone pulled up. I remember um, the the police's initial disclosure of George Floyd right, of what happened with George Floyd. It has no resemblance to reality, none, right? And, and so if you're relying on, uh, uh, you know, the official reports, um, you uh, may or, and often may not get close to the truth. Um, and uh, so, and, and um, as you were just saying, even with, and this is something that, that I, you know, we focused on, and frankly, I want to focus on more, is um, video evidence, you know, these cameras, body-worn cameras worn by police, has the potential, has the potential to really make a difference. But what doesn't change with technology is the power dynamic. What doesn't change is the accountability. And just to take the very specific thing of like, well, who's in control of that footage? Who gets to decide when it's released? Who gets to decide who sees it? You know, in this case, I wrote about Kowalski Trawick. Here's just the thing that, you know, blew my mind is, um, so we got footage as a result of some lawyers having to sue 20 months after the fact, right? 20 months after the fact, we, we got footage. And um, the, the day after we published a story uh, uh, with the uh, footage, the um, 
police oversight board, the civilian oversight board in, in New York City, right, called me and said, well, I called the, actually the lawyer who was involved and I, and I heard uh, afterward um, and said, oh, ProPublica just published this video. Um, do you think you could give us a copy of the video? This is the agency that's in charge, supposedly, right? And has to ask an outside entity for access to the video. That's how it really works in practice, right? So, so you know, technology can make a huge difference, but what it can't surmount is power, right? And 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 that's what I think everybody has to keep in mind. Yeah, and we even saw here in Atlanta, you know, we were pulling officers from federal task force because the Justice Department was not requiring those officers who are on loan to the feds for these operations to activate the body cam. And it was costing the city when we would get into civil litigation uh, to not have that evidence. And they saw, you know, look, it's going to be beneficial all the way around for us to <laughs> turn these things on and, and preserve uh, the evidence. Um, I'll kick to, to Rich and Topher just as a whole on this last question and reform before we get to more Q&A from the audience. But um, what, what are the factors that have spurred reform in, in, as far as what you've seen in your reporting outside of video, if, if any? I'll, I'll step in there first, uh, Richard. And I'll just say, um, enormous scandal that <laughs> that's, that's all I got and that can be spurred by um, really amazing reporting that can generate that scandal uh, as far as revealing something so uh, just um, you know amazing that people can't help but respond to it uh, enormous scandal embarrassment but as we are living in a society where shame and embarrassment means, far, far less than it used to, you know, um, I don't know what will, what will spur that type of change, but that's what I have seen in my reporting. Yeah. So, I mean, just jumping on what Topher said, I mean, right. The lack of shame and the lack of sort of public outcry, like absent that, like, where are you? So there was this case, what was it in 2020, 2020 where, a 14 year old Tramal McGee, he and you know some buddies like stole a car and were joy riding and he ran. And as he was like trying to crawl underneath the shed unarmed face down on the ground, a Jefferson Parish Sheriff's deputy shot him in the back. And you know they were going to charge him with, they arrested him for like resisting arrest and et cetera. And you know, you think that that would be something that there would be sort of, sort of like humbleness or some sort of like contrition on the part of the Sheriff's office. And they were just sort of combated with him. They said, he, that kid knows what happened. If he wants to complain, come in. Um, you know, there are a lot of instances where there is even video. You know, there was an instance uh, at a Mardi Gras parade where it was a viral video and Jacoby Cage, he was attacked basically and assaulted by these deputies. They wrote this completely false report, um, charged him with resisting arrest, with battery and despite the video coming out, it was a viral video viewed like almost 300,000 times, they wanted to proceed with the charges. And the guy who wrote the false report wasn't disciplined. And, you know, again, like if they don't have to fear losing their job, if they don't have to fear being voted out of office, like I don't really know where that pressure is going to come unless it comes from outside and some sort of power that's greater than them. So, I mean, this really plays into one of our first audience questions, and these questions are broken up into different categories. This first one is, what can I do? And so we, we've touched on this a bit, and the dozens of people wrote in asking, what can you do as a concerned citizen to, to spur this change? Rich, you you'd mentioned this conversation with the DOJ, and it's like, hey, if, if people get together in mass and they write the Justice Department, that may get someone's attention. That's one way. Um, Topher, we talked about public shame and outcry and scandal, and, and that obviously involves citizens sometimes. But when you think of the average person and, and what they can do to draw attention uh, to an issue, what, what is it? Is it? Is it contacting the reporters? Is it <laughs> letting you take it from there? Is it writing the DOJ? What is it? Uh, 
this is for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Keep your cell phone charged. Like, I mean, that's one thing you can do. Uh, but the other thing is you have to elect people in your state houses that care about reform. And I don't even know where the where end result of that is, but I know if you do elect people that care about reform, then they can start to try to move the needle from inside the political sphere. So I think about, you know, Ithaca, New York, and they had a young mayor who cared about reform. And so he pursued a lot of the initiatives that his constituents appeared to care about related to their police force. And that's what it took. It had it been a different mayor, those reforms may have not even gotten out the gate. And so um, you have to, I think, elect sheriffs. If you have a sheriff, you have to see if there's a sheriff that cares about these reform initiatives, the ones that you care about, and try to get them in office. Um, but outside of that, keep your cell phone charged. I think if I could chime in, you know, th there are, um, uh, I'm a big fan of keeping your cell phone charged and, uh, you know, um, uh, don't underestimate, you know, the power of one person to witness something and uh, say something. Um, but in addition to that, you know, I think a lot of communities, uh, I know, a, a lot of communities um, have groups that uh, have organized around uh, some of these issues and without speaking to any specific group or, or any specific platform, um, I do think that, uh, you know, groups can be a vehicle for magnifying your voice, right? And, and, um, and for uh, being heard on these issues. And it's surprising actually, um, you know, one, uh, it's, I, I feel like we haven't given a lot of great uh, uplifting news uh, during this. Um, and so one thing that I have, um, uh, found and that is to me heartening is it doesn't take that many voices to to really be heard and um, to get politicians and leaders attention because frankly and honestly not that many people are speaking up uh, most of the time and so when when uh, the occasional person does or the occasional group does it can get people's attention, um, but 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 I would just encourage you know the the collective voice is uh, often more powerful than the individual one, um, and uh, you know that there are people who um, really dedicate uh, themselves to tracking these issues and following these things, and we're seeing uh, uh, you know who in your community does that. And I, I, I kind of go back to the saying, you don't know what you don't know. It's one thing to witness something and, and be front and center and be able to uh, contribute to, to fleshing out a narrative or giving a bigger picture of something. Um, but like, if I'm not a part of one of these groups and I, I'm curious about how accountability has panned out in my jurisdiction, what type of data and, and records are available to the average citizen basically what's available to us, right? I, I mean, what's what's a public record is a public record, but what where would you even start with trying to to figure out what accountability looks like, you know, in my downtown police department, in, in my county sheriff's office? Google? You know, if, if, if you know, the, the United States, uh, uh, for better or worse, doesn't have a... Um, you know, it was, it was a Topher who, who were saying, or maybe it was actually, sorry, Rich, um, you know, 18,000 different law enforcement agencies. Um, you know, we don't have national police, probably for the better, I don't, I don't know. But um, so, you know, that's 18,000 different policies, 18,000 different uh, uh, levels of uh, disclosure. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, so I, I actually think, you know, it's not that hard actually to figure out what is out there and what is not out there. Um, and sometimes it's surprising the, the level of detail uh, that is out there. You know, um, I don't know if we have any um, uh, viewers from Chicago, Chicago, just to take an example, that's a lot of detail. Um, I know New Orleans, uh, federal consent decree has um, uh, published a, a fair bit of information. I hope I'm not wrong on that, Rich, you tell me. Uh, and, um, but, uh, uh, and the other thing is, by the way, you know, going to, to 
whether it's community board meetings and so forth, you know, being an active citizen um, is, I think, a, a meaningful uh, thing. I just want to jump on that. Like the, the thing, and I also think that people should raise awareness for what's not there. So like the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office, does we requested all non-shooting use of force incidents and they didn't have it. They said, we do not track this. That's a, obscene to me, you know? And so I think, and I think that if people raise that, if they went to, as, you know, as Eric was saying, go to these like board meetings and say, where is this information? Why is that not there? And like raise that issue because that should be like just completely unacceptable that you say, I don't know how many of my deputies hit someone. I mean, so I think if people, you know, focus on what's there, but also really focus on what's not there. And again, I just say this is where you can use some of your political power. If you, as a citizen, your right to vote. When it's um, be time for re-election, make that a thing that every you ask the candidates every time you see them at a forum or that you, you get the entities that put on these political forums. I've seen this happen in places I've lived and worked where you, know, you got the entities, they'll get together and like, this is the question we're going to repeatedly ask them every time they go around and do all the little chicken dinner circuits and talk about why they want to be the sheriff again. Well, can you get us a use of force? Some stat data. We want that. Will you commit to that? Like that's part of that process that you can can use. So Topher, a question came in for you about citizens holding police unions accountable or figuring out what's going on within in the union, which we're not talking about something taxpayer funded and public records and all that type of stuff. How do you keep up with the union and, and, and hold their feet to the fire on issues that are impacting that they've got some pull on? Yeah, the, I don't know that the public has any lever of influence on the police unions um, other than, you know, uh, their membership but writ large, like the, the actual members who are employed by the policing agency if there are, you know, trends, problems, and, and issues related to how they're conducting their job and whatever, however that dovetails into the union's work and how the union has interacted with the agency, you might have uh, some leverage that way. But the union is a private, you know, entity and, and it, it answers to its members. And if you aren't a member, then there you go. So Eric, how does that play into oversight boards and what they may or may not be able to do about uh, something impacted by the union power? That, that was a question for you. Like, can, is there anything? Yeah, I mean, you know, at, at the end of the day, to me, the, the thing that we, we looked at uh, is a fundamental question, um, but really across the United States and that, that I think uh, each of us has spoken to different aspects of. And, and that is the kind of fundamental question of um, the, is our law enforcement, are our law enforcement departments truly under civilian control? That's really the question, right? You know, the, the, the military, there's a long and, and um, proud history in the United States of, of civilian control. Right, the the police departments, ironically, though though they're not a military force, have um, uh, uh, often you know that that civilian control is either circumscribed as a result of um, the laws themselves, um, uh, you know the the entities that are the civilian entities literally don't have the power. Um, or, or by policy or culture. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, you know, ultimately the, the sort of question um, that I think we as citizens um, have to face um, and, and to understand the issue clearly. That to me is what it is. Yeah, I know here in Georgia, there's often a question about uh, why the GBI is not investigating a certain case. And this involves an officer and folks not even realizing that the way the statutes are set up, the agency itself has to request the GBI to come in and, and be that independent arm. And so you kind of look at these situations and think, 
oh, there's automatically some type of oversight and it's actually baked into the, the state law that no, there's not. Um, so they would have to be actively involved in wanting some sort of state-sponsored oversight um, for that to even happen. I am getting some new questions in, hold on, my uh, Slack channel is not, let me expand my board here. Uh, let's see. For Eric and Topher, what methods have you deployed to get comprehensive disciplinary records when producing them is required by law, but where there is substantial resistance to doing so? I mean, uh, uh, you know, Topher, you want to uh, uh, take that one? I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, this isn't my story. It's my homie's story. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll let let folks behind a little bit of the, the machinery here is, you know, you source up, you know, Eric was smart. He asked for some data at a time that a lot of folks weren't asking for it. And so we, we got some cool data. That was awesome. But, you know, uh, I'm a real I think it's important when you cover police that you actually talk to the police. Like, I think that's part of the gig. Um, and so I, I have a lot of police sources. And, you know, uh, me and, and my brother Joaquin, we, we sourced up and we, we got a lot of good sources talking to us about, you know, how it works when they're in uniform, like what it looks like for them. And that kind of points us in a lot of directions. We were able to make contact with a number of people. And uh, my, my man Joaquin went into the projects one night and got a box of documents. It was a great story. I can't, I can't give you all the details. On it. A man went into the project, got a box of documents, documents we weren't supposed to have, and we got them, and it was great. It was beautiful. And so we were able to tell a very rich story about all the details and things like that because, you know, we sourced up, and we were able to, to kind of connect with people who had access. But it takes all that. Like, you got to go to the projects and get some, a box of documents. Like, it takes all of that to, to get into some of this, these details. I and want so, that in the lead. I want I want people to understand that in the lead. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's um it's not easy. Um, and it, it shouldn't be that hard. These are people whose salary are paid by all the citizens, and they're doing an important job, and their job can sometimes have life and death consequences. And it should not be that difficult to learn about their their employment history and to learn about their employment track record. And so, um, you know, whatever citizens can do, if it's, you know, uh, joining these politically active bodies and, and making, amplifying their voices so that they're heard, or it's, you know, trying to see how they can find the right candidates, support the right candidates to achieve the kind of reform they want, um, inside and outside game, right? Um, that's what you have to do if you want to see the, the needle move on this. This uh, next question comes from a fellow journalist, uh, Justin Price in the Arizona Republic. Uh, this is to Rich. He said, on the excellent story about misidentification of Hispanic drivers, uh, can you outline broadly the scope of work in a general timeline of, of that reporting? When did that idea come into focus and what aspects of the reporting took the longest to, to flesh out? I mean, it wasn't very linear. So we, you know, we were working on the major first story for, you know, ProPublica, which is like the overarching, like, you know, and we had that like in our pocket and that was always just sitting there and we didn't know whether we were going to have time to do it, honestly. So we got that data, you know, I started in September of 2020 and maybe got that data in January. And then we were like, wow, this is amazing, but we had all these other stories to do. So there wasn't sort of like, we started in you know March and it took us like a month and a half. Um, so, but it wasn't it wasn't that hard. Like once you have the data, then you just have to you know try and figure out what it means and why this is happening. So I wish I wish I had like sort of like this thing I could franchise and be like, yeah, this is how you do it. But no, it's it was I don't know. It was kind of scattershot. 